What if this dream that I can see could change how things are to how they could be? Two letters, that's all. If takes a chance and risks a fall. If starts sooner, stays longer, keeps the faith. Gets back up, goes back to work, sets the pace. Tell me now, what's your what if? What will it take to scale the cliff? Who knows what a day will bring? What if? This changes everything. Last week, we started a brand new teaching series called Shift Your If. You got to be careful how you say that, okay? Shift Your If. It's based on the eighth chapter of the New Testament book called Romans. And if you recall, Pastor John challenged us to read Romans chapter 8 every day during this three-week series so that these life-changing words are seared into our minds and become the dominant way we think about our relationship with God. So I hope you've been reading the chapter. The big takeaway last week was this. There is no regret that God cannot redeem. There's no regret in your life that God cannot redeem. If that doesn't lift your spirit a little bit, if that doesn't take a weight off your shoulders, if it doesn't put a skip in your step, you're not fully understanding the significance of this truth. Because it means every sinful, regretful, hateful choice you've ever made in your life, whether intentional or accidental, it's been nailed to the cross. Jesus allowed himself and his perfectly obedient life to rescue us from the devastating consequences of our sinful regrets. In other words, we were wrecked by sin, and then we were rescued by Jesus. That's why Romans chapter 8 begins with this verse. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If Jesus is your Lord and your Savior... Uh, This is your current reality. There is no condemnation in your life from God if Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You're living in the flow of God's forgiveness because you've been justified by God's grace. Now, perhaps you remember last week, Pastor John said, an easy way to remember what justified means is to think of it as just if I'd never done it. You see, to be justified means that my sinful regrets, all of them have been paid in full by Jesus. And because I've put my faith in him, he graciously and he freely forgives me. In fact, here's how Paul says it. He says, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. But let's not stop there because this is really only half the gospel message. Jesus didn't die on the cross only just to forgive us. He also died to change us. The New Testament word uh, uses words like this about this part of the gospel. It uses regeneration, new creation, new birth, spiritual resurrection to describe this aspect of the gospel. Think of it like this. Imagine you're driving your car and you run through a stop sign and you crash into another car and, and break your leg as a result. You've got two problems. The first is a legal problem. Uh, You've broken the law and you're guilty of breaking the law and someone's got to pay, either you or someone else has got to pay the penalty for the fact that you broke the law. But you've got a second problem and it's a medical problem. Your leg's broken. And this requires a doctor to treat your injury, to bring healing to that which has been broken. Now, the Bible tells us that sin has two devastating consequences to our lives. First of all, sin makes us guilty. We've broken God's law. And second of all, sin makes us spiritually sick. In other words, we now have a bent toward doing that which is sinful. We have a new inclination in our life. Have you ever noticed how it seems like it's easier to sin than it is to do righteous things? We have this nature about us now that's corrupted and we find ourselves bent toward doing that which is dishonoring to God. And see, the gospel addresses both of these issues. Jesus pays our penalty in full on the cross, and 
The gift of the Holy Spirit heals our sin-sick souls, enabling us to live with power beyond ourselves. Now, Paul describes this power that the Holy Spirit gives us in many different verses in the New Testament. Here are a couple. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. There's a power within us because of the Holy Spirit that gives us this new creation. The old is gone and the new is here. When speaking to the Ephesians, here's what he says. I pray that out of, this glorious, out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, inside of us. This is addressing our sin-sick souls and letting us know that God gives us power to overcome this bent that we have towards sin. So I'm not only forgiven, I've been spiritually strengthened, spiritually empowered by the Holy Spirit to live in ways I've never been able to live before. And too many people miss this aspect of the gospel and they suffer from what you might think of as spiritual uh, malnutrition or uh, anemia. They're justified and they're forgiven, no doubt. And that's wonderful. It's what we all want. But they're limping along, struggling and striving to live victoriously this new life that God has blessed them with. It would be like Superman on his deathbed. He had these superpowers his whole life, but he never knew them. And there he is on his deathbed. He looks down, he sees this big S on his chest. And he says, what is this? And someone says, well, you've had superpower your whole life, but why didn't you ever use it? See, what a sad situation that would be. And Paul says in the New Testament, we've been given a divine power to live for God, a power that comes from the presence of the Holy Spirit within our lives. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's like you have a big HS on your chest for Holy Spirit to remind you that you have the power to be a difference maker, not only in your life, but primarily in the life of other people. So today, we're going to shift our if to talk about not if only regrets. That was last week. We're going to talk about what if possibilities. We're going to move from talking about just being forgiven by God to discussing living for God with power and courage and boldness. You can do this. You see, God did not just save us to keep us safe. He saved us to make us dangerous. Now, Pixar Animation Studios, you've probably heard of Pixar Animation. They produce some of our all-time favorite movies. And if you're watching us online, jump in the chat and uh, type in what your favorite Pixar movies are. There's a bunch of good ones, right? Toy Story, one, two, three, and four. (laughs) Um, Cars, The Incredibles, uh, Monsters, Inc. Um, I mean, there's so so many good ones uh, that we've enjoyed over the years. The president of Pixar is a man named Ed Catmill. And a couple years ago, he wrote a book. And the title of his book uh, is Creativity, Inc. And it's in this book that he shares Pixar's strategies for unleashing the creativity of their employees. But right in the middle of the book, something interesting happens. He talks about the what-if possibilities of what he calls Pixar marriages. And what he means by that is these are people who went to work for Pixar met their spouse, and had what he calls Pixar kids. And he says this, if Pixar never existed, those kids would never have been born. And then he tells this story. He says, in 1957, my family went on a road trip to Yellowstone. And on the way back, they were driving through a canyon road, steep canyon road, and on one side, no guardrail, but there was a steep cliff. And a car coming from the other direction drifted into their lane. He said his dad swerved, his mom screamed, and he said he estimates that they came about two inches from driving off of that cliff. And then he makes this sobering statement. He says, two more more inches, no Pixar. Two more inches, no Pixar marriages. Two more inches, no Pixar kids. And he calls these two-inch events. And the truth is, We've all had two-inch events in our life that could have and maybe did radically change the direction of our lives. And thinking about this, the dangers of some of these two-inch events could cause us great fear. 
but it doesn't need to. Not if you're in a relationship with Jesus who said this. He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have, what? Peace. In this world, you will have trouble. We can all attest to that. But take heart, he says. In other words, don't give up. Be encouraged. I have overcome the world. Two inches or two letters. Same difference. The truth is, you're only two letters and one decision away from a totally different and I would say better life. And you might say, what are the two letters you're talking about? I and F, if. So in 2009, I was the associate pastor at another church, Union Park Christian Church it's in Orlando. And it's led by one of my dear friends, uh, good pastor, Tom Hensley. He's, he's a great speaker and has a heart to help people who are suffering from loss and grieving. And he asked me if I'd be willing to help serve families um, in their moment of greatest need. And of course, I said, I said I would. And so he connected me with some families, and he connected me with some funeral homes, and I spoke at a couple, uh, a couple funerals. And in that process, God did something in my head, in my heart, that really just created a desire within me to do all that I could to reach out to families who were in need, going through loss and separation and grieving a loss of a loved one. And... This what-if possibility was born in my heart. And this thought occurred to me. I said to myself, what if I say yes to every opportunity I'm given to lead a family through a crisis of loss, regardless of the place or the time or the circumstance? What if I offer that up to God? And so I did. If I'm able to do it, then I'm going to do it. Listen. Listen. Be careful what you offer up to God. He might do more than you can expect. He might do more than you ever imagined. Especially when your what if is intended to bless others. You might want to get ready. God's vision is always bigger than our vision. You see, my vision was dozens. God's vision was thousands. And 12 years after my what if... And 1,500 funerals later, I've seen God work in hearts in ways that can only be described as miraculous. Amen. And I love this quote from Pastor Rick Warren. He says this, God is looking for people to use, and if you can get usable, he will wear you out. The most dangerous prayer you can pray is this, God use me. If you pray this prayer and you mean it, and it's to the blessing of if it's intended to help other people, if it's a selfless prayer, you can better believe it. God's gonna take you seriously and he's gonna put you to work and he just might wear you out, but he's gonna wear you out doing something so good. Let me ask you a question. What's your what if prayer for God? What is your what if prayer for God? What are you willing to do? What are you willing to give? What are you willing to say? What are you willing to build? Where are you willing to go? Where are you willing to stay to bring God glory and the gospel to other people? And you might be thinking, I could never do anything significant for God. Who am I that God would use me? If that's what you're thinking, you don't see yourself the way God sees you. If you're a believer, God's put within you a new heart. He's given you a divine power through the presence of the Holy Spirit like you've never had before. You've got more power than you could possibly begin to even understand if you're in Christ. Let me tell you about the what if of Steve and Shelley Smelsky, who started a foundation for their son, Jordan, who passed in 2014. That's how I met him. A few years ago, they said this, what if... We give away new and gently used sporting equipment to disadvantaged children at Christmas time in Jordan's honor. You see, Jordan loved Christmas. He loved sports. And he didn't want to see any child go without. Remember what I said a moment ago. When your what if is selfless, focused on blessing others, God opens doors. Six years later, 
more than a thousand bicycles, hundreds of skateboards and scooters and hundreds of soccer balls and footballs and baseballs and rollerblades and safety helmets, just to name a few of the things that have been given out to the glory of God and in honor of Jordan. Because, all because these grieving parents wanted to honor their child and point people to Jesus. Now, they didn't do this on their own. Uh, they had help, and it hasn't been easy. But God's opened doors, he's opened hearts, he's opened wallets in ways they could have never imagined. That's because God's in the business of turning your what-if possibilities into what-if realities. So my question for you once again is, what is your what-if possibility for God? What is the thing that you can do that will point people to Jesus? help people to see the truth of who God is and that Jesus came to love them and save them. The gospel isn't just about forgiveness now and heaven when you die. That's obviously wonderful and that's something that is great and that we want that. But the gospel is also about living an abundant and full life through the power of the Holy Spirit today, right now. Last week, Pastor John told us that the word if is in the Bible 1,784 times. I'm going to take his word for it. One of my favorite ifs in the Bible is this one. If God is for us, who can be against us? That's not a real question. It's a rhetorical question. If God is for us, and he is, then no one can be against us. No one can be against us. There's a simple rule in journalism. And the rule is this. Don't bury the lead, okay? And here's the lead. God is for me every day and in every way. Say this with me. God is for me every day and in every way. That is so true. No matter who you are, no matter where you're from, no matter what you've done, God is on your side. How can I, how can I be so sure of this? How do I know this? Well, look at this verse from Romans. But God demonstrates his love, his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So listen, you don't die for someone you don't love. You don't die for someone you're not for. Jesus died when we refused to even acknowledge him or live for him. Jesus gave his all for us when we weren't willing to give at all for him. He is for us. That's the heart of God. And the proof, the proof is the cross. The proof is the cross. You see, there's a big lie out there that says, and you must not believe this lie. There's a big lie that says, it goes like this. God's mad at me. And because he's mad at me, that's why my life is filled with hurt and disappointment. A lot of people believe that. Some of you believe that. But that's not true. God's not mad at you. I would say God's madly in love with you. But Paul says in Romans 39, this chapter, Romans 8, 39, he says, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And I want to focus for a second on that word, nothing. Nothing can separate you from the love that God has for you. No matter who you are, no matter where in the world you're from, and for a lot of people, this is the point, no matter what you've done. Because there are people who think, I've done so many things that are against who God is that there's just no way he could love me. And that's a lie. That's a lie. He's for you every day in every way. I want to tell you, no matter how far you run or no matter how fast you run, when you turn around, you'll discover that God is right there behind you. Somebody's called him the hound of heaven. <laughs> I like that, the hound of heaven. It, 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 he's, he's chasing us down. His, his goodness and his mercy tracks us down because he wants to give us his love. He wants to show us his love. We talk about a lot about seeking God, you know, uh, searching for God and, and seeking him. But the reality is, in many respects, God's the one seeking us. He's tracking us down. He's tracking you down. 
I love the way author Mark Batterson says it. He says this, God wants to get you where he wants you to go even more than you want to get where God wants you to go. That takes a minute. You got to process that, okay? But the point is, God has a plan for your life and he's given you some power through the Holy Spirit that if you're in Christ, you can live victorious now and God wants to get you somewhere even more than you want to get there because he's for you. To fully appreciate Romans 8.31, that's the verse that we've been focusing on today. If God is for us, then who can be against us? You gotta go all the way back to square one. You gotta take a step back. And for me, ground zero theologically is Isaiah 55. Eight and nine. Man, these are wonderful passages. Here's what it says. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You see, in this passage, this just blows me away. In this passage, God compares the distance between his thoughts and our thoughts to the expanse of space as big. That's real big. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And those four words are the catalyst for all creation. Everything that we know comes from those four words. From the 118 elements on the periodic table to the 80 billion galaxies that make up our universe, those all come from God. And here's the amazing thing. According to the Doppler effect, the universe is still expanding. It's still getting larger and larger. Meaning those four words, let there be light, are still creating galaxies in the outer edges of our universe at probably the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second. But what does that mean for you and I today, right here, right now? It means that whatever you're worried about, whatever you're facing this weekend, whatever you perceive the problems are in your life, God is bigger. He's bigger than any and every problem you ever face. At some point, you might need to stop talking to God about your problems and start talking to your problems about God. Because he's bigger than your problems. I've been to Haiti a few times on, on mission trips, and Haiti is one of the places where if you're out in the country on a dark night and you look up into the sky... Man, you can see some stars. And probably, I'm thinking of one time, probably the most stars I've ever seen. It's like a blanket of light across the sky. And scientists say that you can see about 9,000 stars if, they, if everything's just right. Clear night, super dark, you can see about 9,000 stars. And the most distant star that you can see with the naked eye is called Deneb. And they say it's 1,500 light years away from Earth. That's a long ways. But when you look into space and you see stars, you're seeing some stars that might have already died out. They, they, they might have died out hundreds or maybe even thousands of years ago, but they're so far away that the light is still traveling to Earth. That's how big our universe is. It's kind of like, in some ways, thinking about you're almost looking back in time to something that did exist. Now it's gone, but the light's still coming here. Let me, let me bring this a little closer to home. The nearest star to our planet is our sun, 93 million miles away. And if you drove there at 65 miles per hour nonstop, it would take you 163 years to get there. That's how far away it is. But light, light leaving the sun arrives at earth in eight minutes and 20 seconds. It's how fast it travels. <clears throat> and that's our closest star. Scientists have discovered galaxies 15.5 billion light years away. That distance is incomprehensible. And God says that distance is about the distance between his thoughts and your thoughts. Here's my point. Your best thought on your best day is about 15.5 billion light years short of how great and how God, good God really is. Isn't that amazing? That's true. That deserves a clap, yes. God is amazing. You see, I believe in this God. I believe in a God who's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. I believe in a God who's omnipresent. He's everywhere at once, at the same time, with the same intensity. 
I believe in a God who is highly exalted. I believe in a God who exists outside of the time and the space dimensions that he's created. I believe in a God who can make and break or that who can make and break the laws of nature that he created, that he instituted. I believe in a God whose thoughts are higher than my thoughts. His name is Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God and Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace, and he shall reign, the Bible says, and I believe forever and ever. That's the God that we serve. And he can do immeasurably more than you could ever possibly begin to, to fathom or imagine. <clears throat> Let's read it again. If God is for us, who can be against us? That's the God we serve. Let these words sink into your heart and into your mind. If God is for you, that's a done deal. No one can be against you. Let me, let me close our time together with this, one of my favorite stories. During the 1990 NBA championship season, Michael Jordan <clears throat> um, scored 69 points against the Cleveland, Cleveland Cavaliers. That's, that's amazing. And after the game, he, uh, the game, a reporter asked one of his teammates, uh, Stacy King, how he would remember that epic performance. Now, keep in mind, Stacy King watched most of the game from the bench, okay? In fact, he only scored one point in the game, which is what makes his answer an instant classic. And here's what he said. He said, I will always remember this game as the game that Michael Jordan and I combined for 70 points. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> you see, Stacy King rode Michael Jordan's coattails all the way to the NBA championship, not once, not twice, three times. And here's the point. God goes before us and he wins the victory for us. God is on your side, but the question is, the question is always, are you on God's side? We started out talking about two-inch events, and I believe some of you here today are gonna to have a two-inch event, perhaps even today. A two-inch event that will change the direction, the destination of your life now and forever. Romans 8, or Romans 10, verse 9 is another one of those ifs. It says this, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what's it say? You will be saved. You're only two letters. Two letters, an I and an F, and one decision away from a totally different and better life. Put your trust in Jesus. Make him your Lord and your Savior. Turn from your sinful, regretful ways. Be baptized into his death and his burial and his resurrection and live a victorious life by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is given to you. How was all this possible, you might say? It's only possible because God is for you every day and in every way. So one last time, let's read this verse together out loud. Read it with me. If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen to that. Bow with me and let's pray together. Father, we thank you that in every way conceivable, you are for us. That you love us with an incomprehensible love. No matter who we are, where we're from, or what we've done, we are uh, accepted by you, Father. You love us. As far as the east is from the west, you love us more than we can begin to even understand. And that's that's so amazing. Thank you for caring for us, going to the cross for us, giving us your strength and encouraging us with the truth that nothing separates us from the love that you have for us. Help us with boldness and power through your spirit to live a life that's fully abundant in every way. Give us your strength. Remind us of who you are. We pray this in your son's name.